Yusef Zadeh to appear on our screen, because that's important. There she is. Hi, Perone. Hi. All right, the team is all here. Um, so we are. We have, of course, decided to shorten this session. So I'm gonna both honor uh, what just happened and breathe through that in transitioning into this new convo, um, and also sort of make sure that we hit all of the lovely, amazing people and their expertise and experiences on this stage. So um, I'm Evan Ochkin. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm a Manatma board member, director, writer, translator, uh, arts leader at large right now, uh, very happily. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, as the Manatma board, it was actually, we really thought about, as uh, was mentioned earlier, canceling this weekend of gatherings because it just felt so um, weird to talk about American theater in the context of what's happening in the world, and uh, we decided not to. We really decided that this communal space was very important and that uh, our way of resisting is to create art and talk about art and make our artistic voices heard and advocate for ourselves. So, um, and I feel like we're really going from a conversation with Palestinian artists to this conversation, and it's a little bit of a whiplash, so thank you for being on this journey with us. I don't want to speak for you all, but I'm going to probably take a moment to find my bearings in this reality. Um, oh, do I have printed? Excellent, thank you. I just want to make sure that I'm getting all our acknowledgments correct. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, we're here as part of Reorient Festival of Short Plays as go at Golden Thread, which I am a very proud affiliated artist. Um, and I want to just thank both Art Action and Golden Thread for hosting this amazing gathering. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of the Ramaytush Ohlone people who um, despite centuries of colonization and violence and genocide persist today and are um, in active efforts to um, preserve and revive their culture. And of course, as we acknowledge that, we also want to acknowledge the violence and genocide going on in Gaza and West Bank right now and all of the violence that a lot of our communities are facing, including Armenians, Jewish folks, <laughs> uh, all of us uh, sort of holding a great deal of rage and grief. Um, and I just want to say that that is the space we're in. Um, we have sort of shared a lot of community uh, agreements. Uh, and one of them, two of them that really resonate with me, I'll uplift, is make space for grief and rage. So I just want to say that we're in that space. If we can't hold that space here, where the heck are we going to hold it? And also, I want to say that um, take care of yourself. It's okay to take a break. So I also want to uplift that reality that at any point in this conversation or any of the conversations coming up, if you need to take a break, we will not take it personally. So um, I introduce myself, and I want to just go around these three amazing uh, panelists and ask them to introduce themselves. And I would love you to say your name, pronouns, if you feel comfortable. I'd love you to share, as you define it, your relationship to the Middle Eastern North African region. And I also would love to know any organizational affiliations or however you want to define your place in the American theater. Uh, I'll just say, everyone else you can he, him, his, um, director, writer, and most recently in the context of this conversation about MENA leadership of um, uh, larger national theaters, I was the interim artistic director of Oregon Shakespeare Festival this year, uh, and where I had been for four and a half seasons, the associate artistic director. Um, and got to support the incredible vision of Nataki Garrett. Um, so that's sort of my space in this conversation. Raymond. How do I get to that? Oh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, I'm Raymond. Uh, I use he and they, and uh, I'm the executive artistic director at Cleveland Public Theater. I am Armenian, and I am proudly a theater maker. I love that name and that so much time was spent thinking about it. It just simplifies it. Um, so thank you for that. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Inji Camo. I use she, her pronouns, but I'll respond to any pronouns used in love. I, um, uh, what's the, the next question? I'm Egyptian. I was born in Kuwait, so third culture person, for those of you who uh, identify with that, uh, that definition or that classification. I am the uh, new managing director at a small professional theater company in Seattle called Arts West. Um, and prior to that, I was at Seattle Rep running a program called Public Works, which was um, a community-based theatrical practice in a major regional theater. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Peron Yousafzadeh. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm zooming in from the land of the Dakota people and the Anishinaabe Ojibwe people, also known as Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I am the interim associate artistic director at Playwright Center, and I'm also a director and educator. Uh, I identify as uh, Iranian and Jewish. I'm the child of Iranian Jewish immigrants. Um, and also, uh, I am very much a child of the suburbs of Chicago and the Midwest in general. And it's nice to be with all of you. So I want to get us started. Um, in our earlier session, I sort of named that there has been a moment over the last five years, right before the pandemic, although there's certainly been a lot of leaders of MENA descent in theaters all over, uh, there was sort of a uplifting of MENA leadership around the country of national theaters, theaters with scope or not necessarily focused on Middle Eastern work exclusively. Um, and then in recent times, some of us are staying, some of us are moving on because it ha it's not quite tenable to hold those positions at this time, specifically possibly with our intersectional identities. So when I asked to hold this panel, it was really a conversation about what does it mean to be a leader in the theater right now? What does it mean to be a theater leader of Middle Eastern, North African, Swana descent right now? And what do we need to make sure that these leaders succeed? Because I'm a big believer that we need to be fighting the fight in all corners. And if these folks are fighting this corner, how do we as a community help them succeed? Uh, because their success is our success. Um, I want to start us off with the question of um, our backgrounds, you just heard, are, uh, very different. Uh, some of us are immigrants, some of us are born here, some of us are you know, Armenian, Egyptian, Iranian, Turkish. Uh, you know, it's all over. Um, and I'm sort of curious about what made you take on the mantle of leadership? How did you find yourself here? Why on earth would you do that? And um, yeah, I just want to sort of get a little bit of a, what is the calling at this time? And I'm going to start with Inji because you laughed. I laugh because I ask myself that question sometimes. Um, uh, I've been in my current job for five months as managing director. And I think after the first week or the first two weeks when like the joy of the success of the achievement wore off and I saw the financial situation in front of us, I was like, oh, why did I do this? <laughs> but I mean like, all the anxiety of being responsible for an organization aside, I think the reason is because for me, I feel pretty solid in my values as a person. And I think they are deeply informed by my cultural identity and my path and my journey to where I am now, um, just physically, not even in terms of my career. Um, and I know that there is a way for the theater to feel better for people like me, like young Inji, who started her way in the theater. And I, I, so it feels like an experiment to me. Like, can I utilize the values that I have to enact a better, more positive theatrical opportunity for other folks? Um, yeah, that's why. Okay. Peron, do you want to go? Um, 
Um, sure. I mean, it connects a lot to what Angie was saying, um, as far as the the sort of calling around it. And, you know, for me, it 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 all does go back to how I fell in love with theater, and that was going to see Broadway musicals when they came to Chicago. My parents would take me, not knowing that I was actually going to fall in love with it and not become a doctor, much to their chagrin. And um uh you know, and I and I fell in love with the art form and and the the way I was transported in in watching these shows. But I also accepted on some level that no one looked like me. No one had a story like mine um, or a name like mine. And um, after many years of freelancing, I started to feel like dropping into an organization and stirring things up to whatever extent I could in directing the show I was doing and doing the advocacy around that that I could in that organization. Um, it didn't feel for me like it fully allowed me to bring that experience and vision and hope for what the theater can be. And so I transitioned from freelancing to artistic leadership. And I've also learned a lot of hard lessons around what the conditions need to be for me to be able to thrive and um, persist and continue the hard work. Um, and that, um, well, we can we can talk about that more later. But um, but yeah, it 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 comes back to little Perone. Now it's very much for my own daughter Mariam and for really all the children to have a theater to grow up in where they feel seen and heard um, so that we're leaving something behind that's better than what we had, um, which I think is the hope of any generation. Um, yeah. Wow, that is super inspiring. Um, I think for me, I, I um, thought I was gonna, or what I thought I wanted was to run a small little ensemble company and just do my artwork. Um, and I had a brief stint running a little bit larger organization and I hated it. And I said, I'm never gonna do that again. Pouring all of your heart and soul into other people's art and most of the time they're somehow disappointed or mad at you at the end. <laughs> and that just really sucked. So, um, but at one point, Cleveland Public Theater, which had been one of my artistic homes at that point, uh, was really on the verge of collapse and falling apart and its mission which is um, to nurture compassion and to raise consciousness through groundbreaking performance and life-changing education programs. And I know those words groundbreaking and life-changing are used in a lot of mission statements, but, but like it's true. <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't sit by and see that happen. And the theater was sort of simultaneously shifting to try to be like other theaters and I said, if this thing's going to fall apart, I really want it to fall apart doing something just wildly, deeply in that mission. And so I threw my hat in the ring and, and the board uh, uh, said yes. Um, and that's what started me on it. But that's, I think I, I really planned to do it for like three or four years and, and then go to grad school or something. Uh, still, maybe in three or four years, I'll be in grad school. I still <laughs> always say that. Um, but what's really kept me there is um, the sense of being able to support um, this work of, I'm, I'm sorry that we've lost the amazing um, uh, leader of this song, but this idea of the light within, and I know that sounds super corny, but for me that's really the truth, um, that we all have this light inside of us and to support that and to be able to get up in front of people and put things in front of people that just acknowledges that we're all artists. And um, maybe the calling for art is to awaken that within. Thank you. Um, and I'll sort of speak briefly. It, it, uh, I've always been a little bossy um, from very little, I think. Um, and I've learned that that can be used for good or evil. And um, through my upbringing at Golden Thread under the tutelage of Taranji Gezarian, I learned that there's a lot of ways bossiness can be used for good. 
And um, in a real moment of community immersion and uh, joy of finding myself, my spine, my artistry within this really beautifully held community space, I also had a strong sort of pull towards the big, bad, unknown white theater and that I could do it better. And I think um, a lot of our impulses has to sort of, it's that imposter syndrome intercut with that you're the best. Um, belief that somehow you're going to do it better than anyone else. Um, and I think that sort of has been nourished in me from my parents to a lot of my mentors, including Notaki Garrett. And um, I will say that Turan, uh, Peron, it, it really resonated with me. Um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, where I was for the last five years, um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students come and see those shows. And I watched every day the impact of my decision and my work of who gets to be on that stage and what they get to do and how they get to live and what that meant for those kids. And I was like, okay, for this, I'll work 180 hours a week. Um, so I'm in a really specific space of um, leadership as service and leadership as future building right now. And it's a tough time, but what does that mean for us? Um, so the question, the next question I have is, um, can you share with us, good, bad, and ugly, everything in between, uh, what has been surprising about stepping into your leadership position? And for any of us that have been doing this for a minute, um, what has been a shift that you're noticing right now of what's expected of you? And Peron, I'll go to you first. Um, I feel like I'm in a very different space now in terms of how I answer this question because I work at the Playwright Center <laughs> and um, it's just a very different thing to be in a development organization that is a service organization with playwrights at the center than to be at a producing theater um, because we don't sell tickets and we don't rely on that kind of revenue um, um, that kind of earned income in the way that others, other producing theaters might. Um, so I might speak more to my previous experiences in producing theaters for a moment in terms of what I encountered, if that's okay, Evren. Um, um, I think, you know, what I, what I experienced was that there was a surface level call for invitation to um, leaders of color and um, a hope for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. But that once I was inside of those organizations, what I faced was a daily pressure to corroborate white ideas. And I didn't do that. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I I fought the good fight, and I was proud of the progress that I was able to um, provoke, <laughs> support, um, more often provoke. Um, but um, but ultimately, I think what I learned was that I need to be at an organization where there's a deep buy-in that doesn't require my presence solely to maintain it, um, and that. There has to be in the board or whatever governing body of that organization a deep buy in there as well. Um, and and the sense of sort of being in some kind of adversarial relationship between board and staff or um, staff and subscribers, like whatever, like it just doesn't work. And so there has to be um, more of a collective sense that we're on a journey together. Um, and what I can say about being at the Playwright Center is that um, I feel very fortunate to be at an organization that, however imperfect, is continually interrogating these values. Um, and because service to playwrights is at the center of what we do, um, how we do that more equitably and inclusively is inextricably linked to the mission. Um, so it doesn't, there isn't that sort of tension of like, but we want to support writers, but we have to do Christmas Carol. Like that's not happening. Um, 
So I'm in a very different place with it now. Um, I guess what I've learned is that as I've gotten older and also as we continue to encounter a very difficult and cruel world, um, I'm only... I'm 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 willing to fight the good fight, but not as an army of one. Um, and I'm I'm willing to advance the cause and have the difficult conversations. And I'm okay with disagreement and I'm okay with like hashing it out in a staff meeting, but not if I'm in a place where we're having a flat earth argument about whether or not racism is real or whether or not. The things that matter, matter. Um, as long as we have shared values and it's a question of how we get there and not where are we going, I'm down. Um, so that's what I've learned. I guess I've learned like some people would call it pick your battles. And I guess I'm, I guess the way I think of it is like how to channel my energy most productively and also do the difficult work, work, but with some grace and ease. Did I answer your question, Evren? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not. I when you asked the question, I had no idea what to say for a moment. And I, I'm still not sure about this shift, he said. I think there's a lot of shift that's happened internally in theater. But for me, just what keeps driving me more and more is at Cleveland Public Theater, as we are doing different kinds of programming, just this hunger, this like almost like an addiction of getting to be in an audience when you sense viscerally that what's happening on stage is somehow essential to the people who are in the audience. Um, we do a play with homeless adults who are in treatment for drug and alcohol addiction every year. And to hear an, uh, a character on stage say, uh, this is too much for me, I'm gonna use. And the visceral response from that audience of like, no. And you just know like what's happening on stage matters to that audience so much or um, with Masra Cleveland Al Arabi, you know, talking to people afterwards, you know, in tears saying, you don't know what it's like. You know, I'm a doctor or I'm a lawyer or I'm in business. You don't know what it's like to be in my 50s and for the first time in my life, hear my language spoken on stage in the United States. And, and it's just, those things to me are just, like I said, it's like an addiction. Like I just want to be in that room more and more where those kinds of transformative experiences are happening. And I would also say there's this interesting shift, I think for me, I think I spent so much of my time wanting to prove that I was professional. And, and because the theater did a horrible thing in our history where we differentiated professional theater from amateur by calling it professional and community. And I'm just like, F all that. I wanna be more in community. I wanna have amateurs on stage with professionals. I wanna blend all of this. And I think for me, that's where the most exciting things are happening. I just wanna flip that for a second. Um, this whole idea that amateur means less capable is like so insulting um, when in reality an amateur has just as much capacity and capability as a quote unquote professional artist. It's just that the professional artist is getting paid for that work and oftentimes the amateur is not. So it's like really heart centered work. Um, but because I was so deeply moved by that comment, I have forgotten the question. Can you please repeat it? What has been surprising? What has been surprising about taking on the leadership position, and has there been a shift in the ways uh, that what's being expected of you as a leader at this time? Oh, you answered it perfectly. Um, so, like I said, it's been five months, so I uh, I don't. I mean, yes, okay, true. Um, I've been leading from whatever position I'm in as best I can. Um, and I think that um, what Peron, you were saying also really, like, that really spoke to me, which is that um, this sort of like uh, 
um, parroting the, the, the white leadership expectation um, w was definitely something that I've had to navigate through as a, as a young professional. Um, and I think that was, I'm gonna acknowledge that that was rooted in my family's um, socialization. So as an Egyptian, I was raised by a woman who was deeply informed by the colonialist British mentality. So she very much was Eurocentric in, in the way that she raised me. And was like, yes, you need to be proud of your identity. You need to be proud of your Egyptianness. You are Egyptian. And the way the Europeans do it is really important. The way the Europeans do it has like defined what we think is excellent. So I think I, a lot of my uh, coming into myself and coming into myself as a leader has been to kind of deconstruct that and decolonize my own socialization and education. Um, and I'll also say that I've forgotten my next point. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, are you going to answer this? Sure. Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, I love that. Moderating the moderator. It's nice. It must be a stage full of leaders. Um, so I would say that what, where I'm at, I'm such in the midst of a journey is how it feels. So I don't have like wisdom to drop, but more sort of like where I'm at right now, which is uh, I've always been... Um, uh, a bit of an orator, which is the word I'm using to say I talk a lot. Um, it just sounds better. Um, but it, uh, really trying to find articulation of what my community needs, what I need, how to inspire people. And for a long, I think I stepped into leadership with the idea that that was the most important part. And my experience at OSF and Golden Thread and KQED and everywhere I've gotten to lead from various positions is I've actually realized that the change I need made is a lot of times quite invisible and not that interesting to talk about. My biggest gift that I've given OSF is that their negotiation and contracting process is completely done by artistic folks and completely differently with radical hospitality for the needs of artists, especially specifically artists of color. It's not in any press release. This is maybe the first time I've actually said it out loud in a room full of people who might care about that. Uh, but I realized that the harm that I was trying to fight against for Southern Oregon harm for bodies of color, femme humans, queer humans, um, a lot of it was starting before they even showed up while they were trying to get fucking paid by the organization. And it got to a place where I was like, I rather than making a speech, in fighting the subscribers about how the contracting process is changing, I'm gonna go ahead and get my incredible team together and we're gonna figure this out. Is it perfect? No, but is it a hundred times better? Yes. And it's gonna be better forever because you can't go back once you've changed that. So I'm sort of in a real space of as a leader, what is the systemic, a lot of times invisible, not word and statement based change that we need to make in the field and how can that be the vision rather than big, exciting words that make you feel really good, right? Uh, not to say words aren't important. We all know, I mean, we're theater people. It's really important. But what is the change that's actually on the ground and impacts the day-to-day -day lives of people is sort of where I'm at. And there's so much that needs to change in the American theater, especially sort of these bigger companies, of course, on that front. Um, and I just want to ditto the community audience conversation um, just because I am no longer making work that the audience actively does not want. I'm going to go make it elsewhere. <laughs> that's, that's sort of my <laughs> prone where, I mean, we've talked about it. We, we, we are in agreement on that front. You cannot fight the fight by yourself um, against the whole room. Um, and now I want to bring it to we're in the MENA Theater Makers Alliance meeting. Um, and we're all holding our identities in all sorts of ways, visibly and invisibly. Um, 
Can you speak a little bit about being a person of your heritage and background, however you define that, in these leadership positions? And I would love you to both think of it as what has been some of the opportunities and the victories that have maybe come out of that and what were some of the challenges that you expected or were surprising to you as you stepped into these various positions um, throughout your career, but also, of course, most recently in these executive positions. And I'll say that I was not expecting to be so invisible, is my offering, is that I've never been in more rooms where I was told I was not as when I stepped into leadership positions and the amount of time I had to spend to prove that I was the various things I was saying I was according to other people's understandings of those things as when I was at OSF. So that, that, is, a, that is what I would offer was a big challenge for me. Raymond, I'm gonna go to you first this time. Y yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of the negative things that I could just recapitulate that I think um, all BIPOC folks experience in leadership and the questions and oh suddenly having someone who actually doesn't know much about finance start explaining a balance sheet to me and just those kinds of things happen a lot to um, all of us um, but I, I think instead what I'll say is there's something about I think in, in my heritage and my background this um, a sense of sort of always being in an in-between place um, and that has given me a unique, I think, um, perspective to sort of come in or desire this place where I'm not, where I'm never quite, uh, what do I want to say? I'm never really, I never really feel like I'm in my own community ever. And, uh, and that's, it, it, if that was very painful for me, I think, early in my career. I don't know. If Amelia Cachapero remembers me <laughs> making this big comment about like this is this is not my community here in the middle of TCG and where will I find my community? And then there was a special conference about making work in new way, and I said I still haven't found my community. What's wrong here? And and I think, but that's really actually served me over time because I've stopped really looking for that and instead really wanted to create spaces where people can just simply be in their. And, and sort of welcome rooms for whoever comes in. Um, and that sort of ability to no longer be looking for that group, but really to just provide open spaces for people to talk. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot right now. I don't, I don't, know, I, I don't know how to respond to what's happening in the world right now, but I just keep feeling like there's something brewing in me to create the right kind of space. Um, almost an obligation to not do nothing. Um, so yeah. Um, successes and challenges yeah. is the question. OK. So this is not necessarily a success that I can claim, but it definitely felt like something to celebrate. I will say that when, you know, I finally got that dream job at that predominantly white institution that was gonna give me all the resources that I thought I was gonna need. Um, I was gratified, nay, like uh, exuberant um, to be working with two other MENA folks in the same theater company, one of whom is right here, hi Nabra, the other of whom, Leah Fahori, has since left the theater for, is taking a hiatus from theater. Um, but the fact that like my entire career up until that point was like I'm the only one in the room, to suddenly have two other people working at the same organization in the same meetings was like, ooh, we can have a like locking eye moment and be like, this is BS. And I would say the challenges and part of the reason I personally um, put a, have a lot less faith in large organizations is no matter what we might say, this group of three MENA people, what we might say about 
programming, producing shows that speak to not even our specific culture, but our region, completely ignored. So often, completely ignored. And it always, every time, bit them in the ass. So that was exasperating. And that is a huge challenge, I think, in the traditional regional theater in this country. Um, so my approach is to uh, go small. It's not go big or go home anymore. It's go small for me and focus on intimacy and true relationship building with the audience and true relationship building within the community and make excellent art with the resources that we have and the scale that we have, which is gonna give people a closer experience. It's less about whether or not I'm being seen in the big theater space. You know, to some extent, and I don't mean to disparage these art forms because I think they all have value, but like, to some extent, opera, the way that it has been produced for centuries, feels less relevant. And I feel like we're in this turning point where the regional theater starts to feel less relevant in a similar way because it's become so watered down that it doesn't even try to do much of anything besides stay alive. So uh, those are some big challenges that I see and this is my way of approaching the challenge so that I can um, sleep at night. I really struggle with this question, I have to be honest. Um, and I didn't hear you, Everyone, what was that? Great, tell us about that. <laughs> well, no, I'm I mean, serious. Like, it, negate the question. Let's do it. No, Middle no, Eastern no, no. Space it's not that I. It's a great question. It's just um, there's just a bunch of levels on which I think that challenge is operating for me. One of which is being an Iranian Jew. I sit at like I I I identify as two things that are nationally in terms of their governments like damn near at war with each other and um and i work with and love um many of my palestinian collaborators and arab collaborators um in general and particularly in this moment of great violence and um atrocity um it is very hard to hold my identities with pride when i do not support the actions of those governments so that's a hard thing and then there's the fact that within white spaces i've been expected to represent the entire middle east <laughs> <laughs> and it, be an expert in um, the Quran and um, know uh, Arabic, like the assumptions that have been made. Um, and then I have to explain, no, I'm Jewish. Um, my family speaks Farsi. <laughs> I don't speak Arabic, sorry. Um, and feeling like, and then it touches this sort of high achiever thing that's like, should I know all of these things? I should know all of these things. If I'm going to make change in this PWI, I better like go memorize the Quran and like get fluent in Arabic. What have I been doing? Um, and it's taken a long time to like use those as moments to teach very simply without exerting too much emotional labor that like we are not a monolith and to remember that we are not a monolith. Um, and I, I, I still think that there are some huge issues in the regional theater around haste and wanting to feel like you understand a culture or you've represented a region with one show. You did it. And that's just not how it works. And we all know that because we're in this room. Um, so th those are some of the challenges. Um, I think that like, yeah, if I'm to say what I felt proud of, it has been my ability to, in those moments, 
uh, challenge the cultural conflations and advocate for specificity and individuality and for populating rehearsal rooms with um, po properly such that we're not counting on one person to be the expert, um, but we're all actually working together from our various different expertises, artistic and otherwise. I often joke that like, I didn't get my MFA in being Iranian. I got my MFA in directing um, because like, I think that what often gets forgotten in these PWIs is like, I'm not here as a cultural um, diplomat, I'm here to direct. Um, and and like that, that just as much as a white person, you can expect me to bring my craft. Um, so anyway, again, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think those have been some of the challenges and those have been some of the successes. And I guess now where I am, am is like, I still have hope for the regional theater and maybe it's like a bad boyfriend who's never going to change. I don't know. But, um, but I'd like to think that if we could get out of the mindset of checking a box and think of representation less along out of less in boxes and more along spectrums, especially as with every generation, the fact that we're becoming more and more mixed race as a country, um, maybe we can, we can stop setting ourselves up for failure and hoping that each season touches each category just so, and think of it more long-term as a bigger lifelong conversation. You answered the question perfectly, just so that's said. Uh, I love that well, we're all good students and are really worried about answering my questions. Um, and I just want to say, um, I was already going to invite this, and uh, but then I knew who was here, so I forgot. But um, that uh, I love that everyone is bringing their artistic work into the space along with their leadership work, and that conversation is porous. Um, so I just want to, yes, and that everything y'all are saying about your directing and leadership and together and separately. So I just want to um, just yes, and that proposal. Um, uh, one of the things we hear a lot at Manatma is uh, a wish for more Middle Eastern voices to be heard, a wish for more Middle Eastern plays, Middle Eastern North African plays to be done, whether that be in mainstream theaters, everywhere, right? Development, production, more, more, more. Um, I'm curious about, as leaders of this descent, what has your experience been advocating for this work? I think, NG, you sort of pointed to that a little bit. Um, has it been easier? Has it been harder? Has it been complicated? Um, and as part of this, because gosh darn it, I'm going to center success if it kills me. Can you just share at least one victory you had in programming, advocating for Middle Eastern North African artists or stories? And I'll start to show the way. Uh, so, you know, I supported Nataki Garrett, so I didn't have to fight a big fight with my leadership about this. And um, however, I did have to fight a lot internally for them to understand what all these things meant and that conflation conversation we've had. There was a lot of sort of like, we did that one, uh, you know, kind of thing. Um, I am very proud to say that I have programmed and worked on the first, second, and third uh, plays of Middle Eastern descent in OSF's history um, in 88 years. In 86 years, they had never produced one. And I just want to remind everyone that OSF is an EDI leader, if there is one in the country, right? Uh, despite our complications in this new transitional moment. Um, so it was a real like wake up call for me. And our first one was actually a digital play, Amir Nizar Zouabi's This Is Who I Am, which is a Palestinian um, play about home and place and mourning through um, 
occupation and dehumanization. So uh, that was the first one, and then Mono Monsters on Scene was the second, which I got to direct. Nora El Samahi and Halabaki worked on it with me. And my gift for next season is uh, Barzan Akhavan's wonderful solo show, Befar Mahin, uh, about growing up Iranian and American and learning English from um, in, uh, American pop songs. Uh, which, um, if you know Barzan, it is that joyous play. Um, which was so that's sort of my a parting gift to OSF on my way out was programming that next year. So those are my victories. Uh, Raymond. Wow, I have to go first again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I kind of have a victory and failure. They're all connected. Um, I wanted to start a Middle Eastern North African uh, theater group at Cleveland Public Theater. I was really inspired by Taranch and everything here, and also visited Silk Road Rising, and I and everyone was like, "Yeah, be broadly inclusive," and I was really excited. And I went, you know, and, and I was working in Cleveland, and I didn't have enough real connections in the community. And sort of my process is, we don't say, "Oh, we're going to go do this thing." We kind of to start meeting people and going to things. So I started meeting people and going to like Lebanon Day and visiting church festivals and things like this and just meeting a bunch of people. And I met these Turkish artists who wanted a space to rehearse. I'm like, sure, come and rehearse. And just started creating all these relationships. And then I got some people together and I'm like, hey, what do you think of this idea of maybe doing something? We'll just take it one step at a time. And the, and like some of the people were like, well, the, Tur the Turkish group that, that was there, um, not representing all Turkish people, <laughs> said, said uh, uh, yeah, we're not Middle Eastern, we're European. And uh, anyways, they were, and they, they were not, <laughs> they didn't like everyone. <laughs> everyone was helping me during this process. He did an amazing job directing I Call My Brothers, which was part of like reaching out and building these relationships. And uh, so I'm in this room and I keep talking about this broadly inclusive Middle Eastern North African company. And I can notice there's a lot of dialogue happening and I can't really understand what they're saying. And eventually someone, I, I said, what's happening? And someone said, listen, Raymond, Look at us all. We're not Middle Eastern, North African. We're all Arabs, or at least we all are from Arabic-speaking communities. That's what we want on stage. We're not here for Middle Eastern, North Africa. We're here to hear Arabic on stage. And I was like, heck yeah, that's what we're going to do. And it was both like sad for me, <laughs> but also like, it, it was just so profound because the community was super clear with me and uh, and it's actually been just like an amazing journey with this group. Um, we're opening a play that we haven't finished writing yet and we're opening it on November, I think 17th. So that's super exciting and it was greatly disrupted and, uh, and, uh, and deeply impacted by what's happening. Um, and uh, it's just like a super honor to be in the room every night um, with this group. That's my success and failure. Uh, that's such a fascinating topic, too, because, you know, like, depending on which family member I talk to, they'll either claim Arabness or they won't. There's so many countries, right? Like, our identity for each country and each person in each of our region's countries is unique. Like, this, yeah. The number of people that are classified Arab that are not Arab is astounding. Um, but you all know that. <laughs> um, or speak Arabic, yes. All right, so uh, success. Hmm. That is specific to this cultural identity is really hard to pinpoint for me I would say that my successes are, like you were describing, Evren, subtle and back end. They're like in the one on one conversations. They're in the decision to go with one uh, music director over another. They're in the decision to, like, it's just those minute hallway meetings that lead to real action that feels right. Um, so I don't think because it is about 
just trying to be present and trying to be trying to question always questioning the angles and the realities in front of us finding those successes and solutions in small ways so I can't really like describe them to you here but I know they happened I realize I had one more celebration before I let Perun speak, which is that I got to hire Perun Youssef Zadeh, an Iranian Jew, to direct our It's Christmas Carol, Ridiculous Christmas Show. So that happened. Uh, and she was hired because she's one of the, just so you all know, one of the best comedic directors working in the country today. And directed the ish out of it, if I may say so myself. So that, that is, I need to start claiming that victory. I'm gonna take credit for all of your successes now. Around, please, if that's okay. please. But talk to um, us about well, your that victories. Felt like, I mean, I still talk about that. That was such a coup. I was like, who knew that an Iranian Jew would get to do the holiday show? Like it just, and that's really the, I mean, that, that connects to like where I feel like I've been able to have some success as advocating for, um, for artists in our community, not just for work about our community. And to say like, you know, you want somebody to direct like a big ass musical, like, um, you know, the, like the, the big famous title that's going to sell all the tickets and get everyone to subscribe. Like here are three directors I'm going to, um, recommend to you. And they're all, they're all Mina. Um, and no, the show isn't about being Mina, but once again, like the, the craft, like we're not just here as cultural ambassadors. We, we have craft, we know what we're doing. Um, and so, and I felt like at, at, um, Jiva, where I was the associate artistic director and the director of engagement, I was able to sort of, um, challenge some of those, um, assumptions that were made around who we put on the list and why, um, when we're thinking about particular shows. And I, and the other success I felt I had was I, um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I laugh because I pissed a lot of people off with this one, but I, um, was able to um, articulate why it was important uh, to um, to treat our work the way we would treat the work of any global majority community and thinking about how we put the team together, which I don't think happens very often. Um, and there was a certain person who wanted to direct a certain play and all of these things will remain nameless because I don't want you to Google it. Um, and I just thought it was wildly inappropriate. And I said so. Um, and I explained why, and it didn't happen. Um, so <laughs> um, I think I was able to prevent a harm there, um, a series of harms. And also, um, you know, I feel proud that that like I was able to sort of um, advocate for folks who I know walked through the door there and were able to work there and have worked there repeatedly since. So, um, you know, and I, I think like as much as I want to see our stories on stage, big, small, regional, Broadway, community, public works, like all of it, um, I also want to see us getting to expand our her artistic horizons to whatever extent we wish. And if that's to do the holiday show, great. And if that's to do Shakespeare, dope. And if that's to do, you know, Chekhov, um, Lorca, like I, I want to see that as much as we, as, w as we see our stories. Producers are watching. Perone has an amazing idea for a death of a salesman, everybody. I'm your I agent re now, Perone. I really do. I really do. <laughs> um, I do want to open up for questions, and I don't think we have a mic for you, so I'm going to need you to use your, um, is that mic for, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. is it, is there a mic, is there a mic? Okay, um, think about your questions while we get the mic, um, or I was just going to repeat the question, but you know, to any one of us, all of us, big questions, small questions, what's bubbling up for you all? Adam, show me your theater voice, please. Do you 
Selena plays, and also um, just, yeah, I, I, I find that from a, from a generative artist, artist perspective, I, it often feels like I'm, there, there's, there's such wonderful support and understanding for the type of work within the affinity spaces, and that should not at all be taken for granted. And also that, like, because they're, they're limited resources and inherent to smaller theaters, um, that that, it can, like, a partnership with a larger theater um, can be empowering in that way. And, and yet, I, I'm curious why that feels so rare. Um, so Adam El Sayed, playwright extraordinaire, although many other things, a um, uh, question was about, I'm repeating for the Zoom world, um, uh, partnerships between affinity spaces or community-specific organizations and larger or national organizations with bigger resources. Uh, our thoughts on that, our work on that. I will say that most of my work on this actually happened from my seat at Golden Thread, so from the smaller community-specific side and I found it to be quite challenging um, because uh, at Golden Thread and a lot of the theaters that I've had a chance to work at that are culturally specific, there's a great deal of care placed on process, on uh, cultural specificity, on support, on care of the, uh, a lot of times the trauma performance or the trauma creation that uh, a lot of our plays might go through and um, because regional theaters specifically, but a lot of our bigger, more um, commercially minded organizations, nonprofit or not, where that is not centered. And um, it actually put, uh, I found that there was a lot of, I felt like our name or my name was being used to cover something. Um, so that was my experience. This is a generalization, obviously. Um, I've also had some good partnerships. Um, from my seat at OSF, um, I think it was really important to me to not assume, we didn't do a great deal of partnership like this. We supported smaller organizations to do their own work under the umbrella of O, oh, our digital space, uh, I would say. So it was their work that we were uplifting. Um, but uh, I prefer to listen to what they want to do so uh, in the pandemic space and the financial limitation space, that never got to a full production, but I am a big believer in a big theater not going, we're interested in this Arab play, let me go find an Arab company and tell them that this is good, uh, because we don't know, actually. Um, so um, there's sort of a, uh, my hope for if and when I do lead another larger theater is that some of those conversations like Raymond said can be much more based in the community and the partner's needs and wishes and curatorial voice rather than a top-down capitalist idea of we know better what good is, which I feel happens a lot. Having said this, I agree with you that I, I still have great belief in ethical partnership between small and large organizations to be able to bring great resource to the kind of plays that you write, Adam, for example, and other artists in this room. Uh, Perone, I'm gonna throw it to you if you have an answer. I don't know if you do. Yeah, hey, Adam. I thought it was your voice I heard. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. I was just talking to an artistic leader of a company here in the Twin Cities. Um, uh, that has a very specific mission uh, uh, towards a very particular community here um, that was talking to one of the larger theaters and there was some friction and some resistance to to partnering. Um, I mean, I, I think it's possible. I think, um, I, I you know, top my, the, I think one of the reasons I think it doesn't happen is because um, as much as it potentially could is because I just think in general, uh, as as theaters, like what I see is way too much territorial um, behavior and not enough collaboration. And I think that like for some reason that continues even as we're in this like gigantic financial existential crisis where I just think we should be teaming up a lot more than we are. Um, uh, and and not just for the for financial reasons. Um, I think it's critical that. Um, the larger theater isn't looking to the smaller 
like MENA specific theater to solve their EDI problem or to um, make them woke or make them relevant. <laughs> um, I think it's also really essential for um, those larger theaters, sort of as Evren was saying, to like defer um, when it comes to caretaking for the process and the community and the and the things that need to be in place around the artist for you know for them to do their best work and also for them to be well taken care of. I don't think regional theaters are leading the way on that. And so, um, you know, and I think what often happens with the larger theater being like, well, we're bringing all the dollars is that they think that means they're bringing all the expertise and they're not. Um, um, and, and, and I think it's important to be clear about like, here's what we bring to the table. Here's what you bring to the table. And also, I think the big question that I have is like, what is the smaller MENA specific organization getting from it? Um, because if they have their community and they have their audience and they're doing their work and like, then what is the, what is the benefit of working with a larger institution? And to be, I think, clear about that um, on both ends so that, um, because I think often where these things kind of break down is in misaligned expectations and, um, and unarticulated expectations. Um, so those are some of the thoughts off the top of my head on it. I think it should happen. I think it can. Um, I just think it takes the right leader and the right match. I agree with everything that's already been said. And I think in addition to mutual benefit, it's important for the culturally specific organization or the smaller organization to remember the power that they hold because the larger organization is turning to you for a reason that we need to make sure that we don't like diminish the power that we actually have and to actually speak up and advocate for our needs as smaller organizations. That said, I'm gonna put my production manager hat on for a second and say that I think part of the challenge between, uh, part of the challenge in partnership between a larger organization and a smaller organization budgetarily is the fact that for larger organizations, so much of the planning that is financially based happens way before the artistic team has been selected. And that's kind of backwards from the way that culturally specific organizations work from process over product kind of works. So I think when a large organization reaches out to a smaller organization, it's important to say, well, maybe not this season, maybe next season, let us be part of the planning process so we can inform you about what we actually need to do the project that we both want to accomplish together. Um, but yeah, I think one of the big things that the COVID era or the lockdown era taught large organizations is that that train is moving so fast, the people within the organization themselves can't keep up. Regardless of how many real life advocates you might have in that PWI. Um, so I think there's just something about the system, about this white supremacist system that's just about moving as quickly as possible and even in a nonprofit structure, making as much money as possible um, to honestly like stay alive. They're, they're big and they have to stay alive. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna say much except to say that when you ask the question, I just started scrolling through my memory and I just started getting more and more angry and, and and that's pretty much all I'll say, except except that like now I'm at the point of it. If, if I just like I was asked, okay, I'm gonna say one a little bit more. We were asked to consult on something, and it revolved around some some community planning, and some other things. And I said, you probably have hired some architects or some other people to work on this. We will make the exact hourly wage that they will make. And actually the, the, the group that was doing it said, oh, that makes sense. And they, they were willing to pay that. And, and I, think, I think that's the thing. We, we so quickly undervalue ourselves and we buy into the narrative that we should just be happy to be working with X large organization. And, and it just, it, yeah, M maybe over drinks we can all vet. Vent. Uh, 
I'll share the wisdom of Megan Sandberg Zakian, who's one of the founders of Maya Directors with Prone and I, amazing artist. Uh, her first question to any proposal, anything, is what's your budget, what's your timeline? And if a big organization is coming to you without those two things, they're trying to take advantage of you. Um, so, um, and then they need to be open to changing that timeline and budget, but they better have put some money towards what they're asking you to do. Anyway. Which is the saddest part, actually. You know what? That's actually true. Having been on the inside, that's real. Any other questions? We're getting to the end of our conversation, so I want to make sure. Yes. Uh -huh. Mina and Swana. Sure. Uh, Mina is Middle Eastern North African. OSF is uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Mina is Middle Eastern North African. PWI is pr predominantly white institution. Swana is Southwest Asian and North African. Did I get it all right? So, and I think it's really important. Manatma is Mina Theater Makers Alliance, which is the larger organization that's holding this weekend. And I really appreciate you asking that question. We can be very insidery in our conversations, and it's good to remember that to bring people along with our journey. Um, as I, um, we're here over drinks, over coffee, over what food, so please do ask your questions to us at those spaces. I want to ask one final question as a sort of speed round to end this wonderful conversation with great gratitude to all the three of you. You are, I look to all three of you in different ways for what, uh, I ask myself what would Ray, Ma, Raymond Bob Gann do in this situation often, for example. Um, so I just want to say I'm really thankful. <laughs> I do. I'm really thankful for all three of you. I see your work. I appreciate your work. Um, and I am in deep thankfulness and gratitude for your time here. But on that note, can you please tell this group of people, as a leader trying to fight the good fight as a MENA human, uh, what would you wish these folks knew that you need? What, how can they help you? Speed round. Don't think about it too deep. I'll say, if you make, see me making a mistake, assume I don't know and tell me rather than assuming that I'm doing it purposefully to hurt you, because I'm not. <laughs> um, similar, I'd say hold me accountable. Like, I speak in platitude sometimes, and yes, I speak in draft, which is something that we talked about earlier, but also, like, I'm gonna get it wrong, and if I need to apologize for something, tell me so that I can. Yeah, same. And, and when you do that, remember I'm a human being yeah. and I have feelings and, and you know, uh, talk to me like I'm a human being. Perone? I'm going to ditto all of that. And I'm also going to say, if you see something, yes, yeah, say something. And if you see that say an institution I'm at has done a thing that you don't like, um, perhaps also hold space in your mind for the possibility that I fought a fight and lost. Um, uh, not that I didn't fight the fight at all. That's all. Thank you all. Thank you all. We take a 15 minute break. Yes. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to have this conversation about how we're getting in there with universities and educational institutions and changing that conversation, because there's some amazing work happening in those spaces. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Go get some sun. <laughs> <laughs>